She's the president and CEO of Aqua Bounty Technologies. They're a publicly traded company as well. Uh, it's an aquaculture and seafood biotech company. Uh, and they're leading their growth and commercialization efforts globally. Uh, Sylvia, uh, please take it away. Thanks, Rob. And uh, I, as I listened to Sue, I thought, oh my goodness, we have so much in common. Um, I've spent my entire career working for large publicly traded companies and, and I had an opportunity to um, join Aqua Bounty almost two years ago, which was definitely a startup, even though we're 30 years old. Um, you know, my background is in agriculture and primarily protein-based agriculture. Most recently, I was with U.S. Foods, which is in the U.S. is the second largest broadline food service distributor, and prior to that with Tyson. Um, and I, I was at a point in my career where I really wanted to do something different. I wanted to take a risk. I really wanted to think about doing something different. And I, we actually live in Northwest Arkansas, and, and, which is a fertile area for um, agriculture, startups, et cetera. Uh, you know, people don't realize that we have three of the largest companies in their industries located here. You know, you've got Walmart, you've got Tyson, you've got J.D. Hunt. And so um, I had been running U.S. Foods um, meat, seafood, produce business and had become very interested in seafood and thinking through how do we make make sure that seafood, which is a very healthy protein, becomes more sustainable in terms of its production. And out of the blue, I got a call from a recruiter who's, who I'd known for a long, long time. And he said, Sylvia, I have something that I think would be perfect for you, but it's different. And it was Aqua Bounty. They had come to the board, had come to the realization that they needed someone with a commercial background. My predecessor is a scientist. And so um, what Aqua Bounty uh, is all about is we, it, it's a twofold approach to doing seafood, producing seafood differently. The first is we produce our fish in a land-based recirculating aquaculture system, which is relatively new technology to the industry, for, particularly for salmon. And we use biotechnology that has allowed us to develop a fish that is perfect for that environment. Um, and so we are now the first and only approved um, genetically engineered animal for food use, both by Health Canada and the FDA. And it took us, the, the, the genetic modification actually took place 30 years ago. That's why I say we're a 30 year old startup, but it took us 25 years to navigate the regulatory approval um, process because there was no precedent for it. And so our, our small but mighty team worked very closely with both FDA and Health Canada because there was no process, which is why it took so long. And clearly there would be a lot of scrutiny on a, on an, a, pro, a genetically engineered animal that was going to be used for food, um, food use. But as I've told my team, you know, timing is everything. Um, if you think about what's going around us or on around us, whether it's COVID or climate change or whatever it is, you know, the time is now for what this company is bringing to market. And, and I say that because um, we have the ability with land-based farming to place that nutritional seafood, that nutritional protein close to consumption. And in the US, we import 400,000 metric tons of salmon. It's 97% of the salmon we eat is, is imported from Chile, Norway, Scotland. And you know that, that carbon footprint isn't pretty. Um, so we're now able to put you know, our facilities close to consumption. And now even more importantly, one of the things that COVID exposed is the fragility of our supply chain. Um, so that it, it becomes increasingly important. But we need to do it in a safe, secure, sustainable way and that we recirculate 97% of the water that we use. Our fish consumes less feed. So one of the, one of the challenges to this um, salmon production industry is they're typically produced in ocean cages, which is, you know, it's, it's tough on the oceans. And you're using bycatch, which is not sustainable to create the meal and the oil for the salmon because they're carnivorous. And so because our, our salmon actually consume 25% less feed to get to the same harvest weight, and they do it in an accelerated fashion when they're most vulnerable, we think we have the perfect solution to start meeting that protein gap in a very safe and sustainable way. So that's, that's what we do. And, and quite frankly, that's why I joined the company is it had innovation with a purpose. 
And I wanted to do something that would impact our environment in a sustainable, you know, in a critically sustainable way. That's great, Sylvia, thanks. Um, I have, a, as somebody who's worked in ag tech and project development, I definitely understand some of the challenges, um, though not to, to the level that you've got. But um, before I get started, we do have a question from the audience already, so we'll dive right into that and I'll, I'll fill in things later. Um, and it was a question around, what are your thoughts around Publix expanding its hydroponic operations to have hydro growers in the state where they operate? I think it makes a, a lot of sense. And, and actually one of the things that we're exploring is, um, you know, when Sue was talking about doing several ra capital raises, we've done that because we're positioning ourselves to build, um, we have two farms currently, but to build a farm that's roughly eight to 10, si 10 times the size of the largest farm we operate. But when you think about it, um, because we can produce salmon in the heartland, our farm is in Indiana, we plan to be in the Midwest. It's really synergistic with what, um, the questioner asked, which is, I believe vertical farming, hydroponics, those that is the future of produce production. And it's very symbiotic with what we do because our waste streams, you know, waste, our waste treatment, the solid waste, as well as carbon dioxide um, and the way we use our water, um, you know, they, they could co-locate very, very well. And so I think it's gonna open up a lot of opportunity to think about agriculture and aquaculture, which I think is just another form of agriculture to think about it differently. And, and so I really do believe that we're gonna see a lot more activity in that area because it's necessary. You think what's going on in California or you think about what's going on in Florida, our big produce producing states, if we can bring them to you know, the Midwest, you're, you're cutting your carbon footprint, you're, you know, your seasonal, issues um, are reduced, all of that. So answer, long, long-winded answer, yes. <laughs> yeah, the energy water nexus around agriculture is a, is a tremendous issue along with the, uh, like you said, the emissions that go into transport and, and all of that. Uh, Tom Blum's got another question on, what are the gross margins for, for your sort of business, you know, cost of feed, labor, et cetera, versus the sale price of fish per pound, kilogram, Etc. So our, we estimate that our um, gross margins are roughly in the 30 to 35 percent. Um, and it, in the what we compare ourselves to are net pen farmers and others that are for, that are farming non-transgenic salmon. Um, and so the advantage of our of the biotechnology approach, our genetic engineering allows us to grow um, more rapidly in their early stages. It was really, the genesis was trying to create a, a fish that would survive in the ocean. But what it gave us was a fish that grows much more rapidly than a traditional Atlantic salmon in the early stages. And that allows us to spread fixed cost more throughput for the same dollar of investment. And as I said, you know, our feed conversion is 25 is a 25 percent improvement, and that's our largest. It's 50 percent of our variable cost. Um, so we get two times the EBITDA that you could get raising conventional salmon in a similar facility. That's great. Um, so you uh, and conventional salmon farming, you said that's roughly what 97 percent of the the market right now. Um, yeah. Okay. It, um, majority of majority of salmon in the U.S. and in most markets is not wild caught. There, there, there's challenges with wild caught, but in the U.S., that's only about three percent of our consumption because there's quotas. It's seasonal, so most of what we consume in the U.S. is farmed Atlantic salmon, and it's farmed in those ocean net pens. And because salmon are cold water fish, it, they have to be in the right environment. Land-based farming, which is what we do, allows you to create that product. You know, to put that production where it could never have, um, it, where you wouldn't even have thought about it, like Indiana. I mean, who would think that you would raise fish in Indiana or salmon in Indiana, but we can't. <laughs> so you've also got faster time to market then as well. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so another question from a uh, very active uh, Ibrahim Ihari is uh, now that regulation has been dealt with, uh, what is your biggest barrier entry on consumer markets? Which I, I think a lot of the um, alternative uh, protein uh, is facing. So I think that'd be instructive, not just for, for Aqua Bounty, but for a lot of, uh, you know, other similar products. Right. You know, um, what I'd say is 
that the anti-GMO activists have had a very loud, outsized, non-scientific voice to consumers for quite a while. And what happened on the crop side, which is where this really started, is they, they wanted to throw science at it once consumers raised concerns, right? But the whole, and really who they spoke to was the customer, which was the farmer with no thought to the end, you, you know, the end consumer. And I think there's a couple of things I would say. We've done extensive research around consumer acceptance and I think it's evolving and I think it's evolving rapidly. What we found is there's probably 20% of the population that are um, adamantly opposed to GMOs, doesn't matter about, about the science, you know, 25 years of testing, I don't care. Um, I'm, you know, again, but 80% of consumers want an affordable quality, accessible, nutritious protein. And because, and I actually think they're becoming much more comfortable with biotechnology, but it's us, uh, it's really up to us to create the transparency that develops the trust with consumers. When they hear this, it's not throwing science at them, it's helping them understand why we did what we did and the benefits to them. And what we found was we got a 70% purchase intent for our salmon. So when you hear all of this noise around, I'm never gonna eat a GMO, I don't think consumers realize how many products they eat today are GMOs and the fact that we have the most affordable and accessible food supply in the world because of GMOs. And so I think that, you know, I think it's evolving. Well, I mean, to that point, uh, the, the corn that you see today is genetically modified. And again, what's genetically modified for a long time was just, you know, crop selection and, you know, it's, it's accelerated now, kind of like you said. Right. Um, so, you know, but obviously I think also the success of, you know, Beyond Burger, Impossible Meats, things like that, or even market success, even if it's, you know, traction, uh, I mean, it's at my Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, I, I think that's going to help for right. all, the, all the companies like, like yourself. Uh, another question from uh, Marshall uh, Mermel is, do you see any advantages uh, for biochar in aquaculture or soil health? And I frame that a little bit broader uh, on the, You'd mentioned the symbiosis potential with, um, with, you know, uh, with produce production and different and, formats and, and, yeah. and CEA and indoor indoor ag. So maybe speak to that about how, um, you know, aquaponics and aquaculture can can help overall soil health and, and quality and things like that, as well as nutrient health for for other produce or things like that. Yeah, we really don't. Um, yeah, you know, we're really focused on aquaculture. Um, so I don't, and there's not soil involved. So even though I do think that there's an opportunity for us, and, and we're in a number of discussions with produce companies that are forward thinking about new new methods of farming, um, we we don't really I mean, we don't really necessarily impact the soil other than we are you know we're utilizing our solid waste streams. Um, I think it's it's definitely a dialogue that we need to be thinking about to make sure that we are in fact out four to five steps. Um, and planning to make sure that we are not, you know, that, that carbon sequestration and neutrality, all of those things are built into um, a co-located type of operation. That's great. And we're, we've got about two minutes left. So um, I've got one last question from the uh, audience. Um, uh, Tom's Tom Blum uh, with a great follow-up. Uh, he's he's a ceaseless moderator as well as participant. Uh, what are your kind of break-even numbers? And before you answer that, just to tee it off that, you know, we've got about two minutes left. So any other closing thoughts that you have? Okay. So we uh, that's one of the reasons that we are um, in the process of raising the project financing for the next farm for the next farm. We will um, we need about three thousand metric ton, three to four thousand metric tons of salmon to be self-funding, um, producing and selling. And we, we don't expect a premium price, even though we believe that we have a premium product. Um, we plan to bring this to you know, consumers at an affordable price because we think you know, the, other, the other challenge that we face um, as a society is uh, microbial resistance. So we're growing it in a very biosecure environment and affordability because you're gonna have to think about nutrition. We don't have good nutrition in the US. And so, and a lot of that is affordability and accessibility. And I think that, you know, we can play a significant role um, to solve both of those challenges. 
And so our next farm gets us to more than self-funding. Um, and that's why it is it is absolutely an inflection point for Aqua Bounty to, to finance and build that next farm. And in terms of closing comments, um, what I would say is, you know, globally we face incredible challenges. We're gonna have population that's gonna be nine, 10 billion people. How are we gonna feed them if we don't start thinking about new methods and embrace science and technology? How are we going to solve for some of the climate issues if we continue to do the things that we've always done? Um, and so I really believe that the time is now for consumers to understand the benefits of biotechnology and the fact that yes, we need it to be well-regulated, safe, you know, sustainable, all of those things need to be factored into it. Um, but I think most of the companies like ours in this space, that's what we're committed to. I think we're purpose-driven organizations and we wanna help consumers really understand that we are addressing those global challenges with new innovative ways to solve for. All right, that's great. Uh, well said. Thank you, Sylvia.